All right, who's ready for one more book this year? Time to look at Animal Farm by George Orwell. Now, what's interesting about this book, if you look at the title page, it's a fairy story. A fairy story by George Orwell. And if you've uh, begun reading it, or maybe you've even finished reading it by now, you might be thinking that, you know, I've, I've seen fairy tales before. Perhaps you're uh, familiar with the uh, corpus of work produced by Disney, which is sort of a uh, curator of fairy stories, and very little of it seems like it would fit uh, with what we see here, with animals murdering each other and all sorts of mayhem, uh, especially also considering how much of a deeply political overlay there is. So as we're going to go into in this video, this is a parable or a fairy tale version of the Russian Revolution and the rise of international communism which just doesn't seem to sit in the same waiting room with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. However, to think of a story about communism as a fairy tale is sort of interesting, especially considering how much idealism was used to promote the communist system or any sort of socialist system, the idea of a magical worker's paradise. And so you can say, okay, let's, let's walk into fairyland. Let's go down this rabbit trail, this rabbit hole, and see what's on the other side. What type of fairy tale does this end up being? Now, George Orwell, as an author, is an interesting fellow. He started out as a socialist himself. He was actually very interested in the ideas promoted by socialists in the early 20th century and followed them with interest during his life. However, as he took note of events that were taking place in countries that became socialist or communist, he realized that the fairy tale that had been promoted by Marxists had ended up becoming a nightmare lived by millions of people who suffered in places like the Soviet Union. And so in writing this story, he creates a fairy tale scene almost, talking animals, uh, a lot of them are very whimsical even, but he shows the degradation that follows in a communist system, and he shows how the nature of the system itself, first of all, does not deliver on the promises and ideals, but also that by its nature it becomes the tool of disreputable and violent leaders and ends up even degrading the noblest of citizens. And we'll see some tragic examples of that in this story. In this video, we're gonna go through and look at the connections between the events of Animal Farm and the Russian Revolution, and uh, think through how this fairy tale works. Let's go. The story of the demise of Farmer Jones is a reflection of the demise of the Tsar and his family. Although in the case of the Tsar and his family, it's a little bit easier perhaps to be sympathetic, although you do have to remember the sense of oppression that prevailed in Russia at that time. There were a lot of crises that kind of led up to the demise of the family, the Romanov family, but it ultimately ended in the very early hours of July 17 in 1918 when a group of executioners showed up at their house, took them down to kind of a basement area, and shot them with handguns at close range. The entire family was massacred in a really shocking incident. Even the children, uh, he had many daughters and a son, and uh, it was very brutal. In the wake of the Tsar, various factions in Russia rise up. In 1918, the communists declare themselves the Russian Communist Party and move their capital to Moscow. By 1919, the Third Internationale is formed and there is this new goal of spreading communism internationally. It takes on this international vision, which you'll see that in Animal Farm. By the end, animalism is seen as a way to spread an ideology across other farms 
in other lands. By the 1920s, the economic crisis that has arisen from the fall of the Tsar and the new collectivization of the Russian economy begins to tell. By the beginning of 1921, the ruble lost 96% of its pre-World War I value. Industrial production fell to 10% of its 1913 level. And the population of Petrograd, modern-day St. Petersburg, fell from 2.5 million in 1917 to just 600,000 in 1920. So there's, there's a lot of turmoil. And you can kind of see that again reflected in the animal farm story where the years after the animals revolt, they see serious economic hardship, productivity, that sort of thing. By 1922, Stalin is appointed general secretary for the Communist Party, and it is at this point in December of 22 that they begin calling it the Soviet Union, which is what it will be known as until the Soviet Union eventually falls in the 1990s. In 1924, Vladimir Lenin dies. He had been the first leader of the Communist Party, and there's a struggle that breaks out between Leon Trotsky and Stalin. Stalin had been the uh, general secretary up, up till this point. And in the book, we see this struggle represented by the rivalry between Napoleon, representing Stalin, and Snowball, representing Leon Trotsky. Well, as you could probably figure from having read the book, Stalin is going to end up winning that struggle and uh, banning Trotsky. Uh, he is portrayed uh, instead of a hero as a villain in Russia and in 1927 Stalin launches the revolution from above where he sets goals for rapid industrialization, collectivization of agriculture, and he wanted to erase all traces of capitalism and transform the Soviet Union into a completely industrialized and socialist state. Stalin proposed various plans to industrialize the Soviet Union, and a lot of these plans involved, uh, of course, lots of collectivization, getting rid of private ownership in any form, but also selling a lot of the grain produced in the Soviet Union, especially from Ukraine, which was a very fertile area within the Soviet Union, for industrial equipment from other industrial nations. And this trade meant that the Soviet Union did become industrial faster, perhaps, than it would have otherwise, but at the cost of millions of lives due to starvation. Basically, the starvation was caused for two reasons. One, the collectivization ended up being much less efficient as a way to produce crops than uh, the previous methods and also anything that could be sold to other nations to buy industrial equipment uh, was sold, which resulted in a uh, widespread famine that was very acute, again, in Ukraine. And one of the ironies of the time was how Ukraine did not experience a drought or pestilence or even war during the 1930s, and yet some 33 million died of starvation, 33 million at least. The Ukrainians refer to this as the Holodomor, or uh, which roughly means uh, a time of killing or a time of death. And it seems that the policy of the Soviet Union was aimed at, in part, buying industrial equipment, but also in suppressing any resistance to Soviet rule by killing off many Ukrainians and especially killing their spirit to revel or revolt. Um, to this day, many Ukrainians are very bitter about the treatment that they received at the hands of the Soviet Union. And uh, really, from the 1930s through the 40s, the people of Ukraine just had a terrible, terrible time because as soon as they had emerged from the famine of the 30s, it wasn't very long before they were subjected to invasion by Nazi Germany, and then after that uh, became locked in the Cold War for a lot of the rest of the 20th century. In any case, the Soviet industrialization policies 
claimed the lives of millions in Ukraine and throughout the Soviet Union. Another feature in Animal Farm is the accounts of denunciations of traitors. And this also reflects a dynamic that was very common and present, especially in the early half of the 20th century in the Soviet Union, really from the time Lenin comes in power, uh, and especially under Stalin, through Stalin's life. He doesn't die until the 1950s. And you saw massive amounts of people arrested under suspicion of some sort of anti-government activity. Uh, sometimes that could be uh, a comment that they made that somebody took as being defeatist or critical of communism or the Soviet Union. Sometimes it could simply be people who were caught picking up left, uh, grain that was left on the ground in a field to feed their families, and uh, it was quickly pointed out that the grain that they were picking up was the property of the Soviet Union and that to pick it up off the ground was theft, and off to the gulag they would go. There were extensive labor camps throughout the Soviet Union, but especially in the very distant parts of the country, in Siberia, into Central Asia, where prisoners who were arrested under all sorts of uh, trumped-up charges were sent. The death toll in these camps was extremely high. The survival rate was very low. Generally, uh, a basic sentence would be something like 10 years, and then you could add on 5, 10, 15, 20 years in addition for anything that was seen as an aggravating uh, factor. A joke uh, that was told in the Soviet Union was you have two prisoners on the train to their labor camp destination and the one prisoner asks, well how long are you in for? And uh, he says, well I'm, I'm in for 15 years. Oh wow, what did you do? I didn't do anything. No, no, what did you do? Oh, I didn't do anything. Come on, you only get 10 years for doing nothing. You must have done something to get 15. And so it goes. Uh, a lot of A lot of humor uh, very dark humor coming out of these circumstances. Very often people who were accused were tortured and very frequently they were killed on the spot with a pistol. Uh, there's a lot of very grisly stories about that which Orwell represents in the denunciation and execution scenes in Animal Farm. So to turn now to Animal Farm itself, one of the first characters we meet is the old pig called Old Major. Old Major represents kind of a combination of Marx, Engels, and maybe Lenin, these ideological visionaries. And before he dies, he passes on his vision for animalism and propounds the commandments, culminating in the, uh, the last commandment, all animals are equal. And he teaches them to sing the song about uh, the animals, beasts of England. Next we meet some other pigs, starting with Snowball, who represents or is a, the pig version of Leon Trotsky, one of the emerging leaders. And you notice that the pigs in general are meant to represent kind of the intellectual class or party leadership class which rises up in the Soviet Union. They kind of take charge of everything because of their profession of superior brain power. Stalin is represented by the pig Napoleon, extremely brutal, politically savvy, even jaded, who ends up dominating the leadership of Animal Farm. Of course, the animals rise up to throw off the sinister Mr. Jones, who is a representation of the Tsars of Russia, and his brutality and drinking habits kind of show how he represents the Tsars fall into ineffectiveness and decadence. As the animals band together, they're able to throw off or throw out Jones, just as the Soviet revolutionaries were able to throw off the Tsarist rule, and in that case actually massacre the Tsarist family. In this case, the animals then take control of the farm, declaring it Animal Farm, and it is soon led 
according to the principles of animalism under the leadership of the pigs. Other animals represent different parts of the population. For instance, the strong horse boxer represents that core working man of Russia who is willing to work hard and sacrifice, whether it be in time of peace, working in fields or factories, or in time of war, fighting against the enemies of the farm or the Soviet Union. A very noble type of person who is quick to believe and to trust. Boxer and adopts the slogans, I will work harder, and Napoleon is always right. He ends up being one of the most tragic figures in the story as his faithful work and sacrifice are manipulated and he's ultimately exploited for the benefit of Napoleon. Of course, we also have the sheep representing the brainless multitude, weak creatures who depend on the protection of the powerful and who will support almost anybody who can put together a flashy sounding slogan the sheep have almost zero capacity to remember what has happened, who has betrayed who, who has lied to who, and they are easily manipulated by the pigs to support any regime that begins to take root in the farm. The plan to build a windmill represents the push towards Soviet industrialization and the way in which the Soviet Union sacrificed to accomplish this goal and the way in which the Soviet leadership was willing to sacrifice millions of lives in the same way ultimately Napoleon manipulates the situation politically to build the windmill any failure is seen as an attempt to sabotage the cause of animalism just as the Soviet Union would say any uh, sabotage or failure of their industrial plans were as the result of either traitors from within or enemies from without. With the building of the windmill you also see this, the uh, farm uh, growing to have actual contact with neighboring farms. You, there's at least two neighboring farms in the story and if you remember initially the a animals were not to have any interaction with other humans. Uh, but just as the animals on the farm ultimately decided to do business with their neighbors, so also the Soviet Union was starting to do business to buy industrial equipment from other nations. And you can see the way the Soviet Union is uh, also reflected in the farm, where Napoleon tries to either make wars or peace with different uh, outside nations, um, this can be seen in the way that the Soviet Union tried to make treaties or make war on their neighbors, especially Great Britain and Germany. Uh, for instance, in World War II, uh, the Soviet Union made treaties with every single major nation in the war and uh, were obviously uh, backstabbed for doing that, especially by Hitler. In the same way, Napoleon wheels and deals and uh, you know, no matter what he does or how obvious it turns out that something that Napoleon has decided to do was not wise, any failure is blamed on outsiders, scapegoats are found, put to death, and uh, everyone goes around saying Napoleon is always right. As the story winds its tragic way through, we see how Napoleon grows in his tyrannical power, subjecting the farm animals to a regime of terror and although very few can remember by the end of the story what it was like to live under human rule it is clear that even though Jones was no picnic life under Napoleon is truly awful although they're constantly being told that their sacrifice is about to pay off that the fairy tale that they were told to believe in is about to be realized. However, we see that the very nature of truth and the law is gradually shifting as the story goes on, and the very last scene is very surreal as the pigs are gathering and they're in a conference with even, even other humans, and there's interest in spreading their vision for how to run a farm and to get the most out of it, exploit it to the utmost, and 
as the animals looking in the window see the pigs and see the men, they find that they cannot dis see a major difference between the men's faces and the pigs' faces. Sort of ultimately, this idea that the fairy tale was told as a way to escape tyranny, but when implemented, tyranny was restored tenfold to the farm. If you like depressing Orwell novels and you're, you feel like you haven't gotten as depressed as you need to be, you could always pick up uh, his other novel, 1984, which envisions a dystopian future in which uh, totalitarian states have come to rule the world. And, uh, you know, it's an even grimmer picture of what happens when something like communism or socialism are allowed to dominate in a society. But as we've looked at this story, it's, it's a really interesting picture of how uh, people will look for relief from suffering, a very sympathetic problem. The plight of the animals at the beginning of the novel is, is serious, and uh, they really do suffer unjustly under the rule of the evil Mr. Jones. However, the story is sort of this gradual unfolding of something even more sinister. And again, it's that idea of believing the wrong fairy tale will lead to a nightmare. So a question for us to consider now is what about these types of appeals made in the ideology and the propaganda of socialism, communism, even to this day, it's still a very popular concept. What makes this appeal so durable, even in the light of so many historical failures on the part of socialists and communist governments and communist projects? Generally, people kind of come back and say, well, yeah, I know the Soviet Union ended up killing millions of their own people, but if they just did this and this and this different, or that and that, uh, Orwell's claim is that by nature these systems turn into tyrannies, uh, and that their appeals are always very strong, especially to people who sort of look at their current circumstances and would love to imagine something that would take a lot of their troubles away. So that's a question you can think about. Why is the appeal so strong for socialist and communist ideas? And how is the best way to maybe provide a warning? Are these novels an effective means of doing that? Uh, you know, maybe even more effective than a, a delicious Chicago-style hot dog? Uh, what would it take to allow people who haven't known a lot of suffering to identify with the suffering caused by communism and socialism. Anyway, these are things that you can consider as you continue to work on Animal Farm.